Ren, we've been abandoned by John. It's bound to happen. He's left us to our own devices, which is not probably not a good idea. It's not. It's probably not good when your name is originally on the podcast, um, and you name it originally the Goodman Show, and then there's no Goodman on the actual podcast. <laughs> um, it will be either the worst podcast of all time or the very best ever. Uh, and uh, it will finally figure out that we don't need Goodman. Uh, and he can stay <laughs> we'll Branch whatever's... off and do our own thing. <laughs> right, right, right. We just, we'll just branch off. Uh, and he can stay in whatever Central American community he's in. Nicaragua, May. yeah. Uh, whatever. Yeah, he's it's had all it the same to me. I'm sure he'll tell us all the stories yeah. when he gets back. So today yeah. we're going to go over how to handle when a potential client tells you that you're too expensive. Ren, I imagine Ooh. that's probably something that you are coaching students through a lot, would be my guess. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's super, super common. And man, you know, and so much of it's in, in, internal. But, 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 you know, if you're already thinking that as a coach, especially if you're a new coach, man, it really sucks for someone to say it. It's like soul crushing, isn't it? Like, you're sitting there thinking, oh, maybe I can go up from $65 to $70 or some, some minuscule amount for your efforts. And that then somebody even says, cover your payment gateway. Right, right. <laughs> that doesn't cover anything, right? You're living in a box doing training out of a box down by the river, right? And, and then somebody says, I don't know, 75 is too expensive. That's outrageous. Yeah. And then your soul is crushed. So I'm so glad that you wrote an incredible post about this, number one. But number two, you're going to share those insights and I'm going to be as much of a distraction as possible as you attempt to do that, uh, which is the role that I play here, obviously. It is, and that'll be interesting since I'm so easily distractible. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah, you wrote a great post about this. I'm, I'm excited to revisit yeah. it because I've, I've forgotten a lot of it, but I, I remember That's it was okay. awesome. It was a fun one. It was based off of um, a conversation I had with someone who was struggling, you know, with this and mm -hmm. everyone does, especially like you mentioned, like when you're first starting, like this is like the worst possible thing someone can say to you. You're already terrified to mention the price that you have. And then for someone to be like, I knew it, I'm too expensive, ah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so it's always oh. interesting to me what the reactions are when someone's told this. It's either, oh my God, I knew it. I'm terrible. I asked too much. No one's ever going to pay for me. But then there are yeah. also some of these other really interesting reactions, which I find funny, which are usually really defensive. Well, mm. then you're not my customer. Well, you can go somewhere else, you know, and pay, yeah. pay less. Or, you know, that person's just being cheap, um, you know, or they'll try to like talk about the features instead. Like, well, oh we're priced this way because I offer, you know, two calls a week and I'm available 24 seven. And, you know, yeah. I, I write everything in gold, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah. But it doesn't help. Right. And that's kind of the the problem. <laughs> and so that's why I wanted to, to tackle this and, and why I wrote the post originally. So the next time that you run into a potential customer client and they're saying that what you're offering is too expensive, try responding with thanks for the feedback. I can definitely appreciate the price point doesn't work for everyone. I'm uh -huh. curious, what would you need to see included to make the price point seem reasonable? Gosh, so good. So good. So like, how did you come up with that? Part of it is just knowing that people are terrible communicators, mm, right? Mm -hmm. And so trying to give a response to someone saying, hey, buy from me is awkward. Culturally, right. it is awkward, especially in the yeah. US where like, we don't wanna do that kind of confrontation. And so like, it's awkward. And so we just like word vomit a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So oh. making a, a safe space and like giving an opportunity to dig more is kind of the idea behind this, but I'll break down the, the framework here. So the That's very awesome. the very first sentence is, you know, thanks for the feedback. So most people are anticipating confrontation before anything actually happens. So when they say that you're too expensive, they're already expecting 
you to, to come back at them defensively because it does happen a lot. So showing right. that you appreciate the fact that they communicated anything will help put them at ease and open the door to, to more communication. Right, right. And then acknowledging that the price point doesn't work for everyone because that's true. I mean, there's, there's mm -hmm. just no way about it. And that's, I mean, that's kind of the point. Right. That's so, that's so, that's so Jedi though. Um, it, it's almost like in, in, in jujitsu and obviously the jujitsu practitioners no longer listen to our show because of John, but it, it's just like in jujitsu where they tell you that if you're a smaller combatant, you use the person's momentum against them. You use their strength, mm -hmm. their their aggressiveness, and you and you just allow them to continue with that momentum. Uh, that's that's so much like what you do when you say, "I appreciate the feedback." It's like if I'm pissed off about the price you just gave me, like what what do I possibly do after that as a consumer? Oh my god, you just it you takes know, the fire. I'm out. ready to go to war. Right, right. I'm ready to go to war, mm -hmm. and you just thank me. What kind of weirdo are you? <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I, I love yeah, it. I get that question uh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not related <laughs> to this topic. Uh, just generally speaking, Amber regularly yeah, gets generally, yeah, question. What kind of weirdo are you? Uh, <laughs> you're our weirdo. weirdo. Yeah. You're, you're yeah, our exactly. weirdo, Amber. We yeah, appreciate That's all that matters. Oh. So, sorry for interrupting. It's just what I do. <laughs> yep. That's, that's why we have you. <laughs> um, but on top of that, so obviously it's showing empathy because it's not something that everyone can afford, but yeah. it's also showing that you're confident in your price, that you know that you're worth it mm -hmm. despite it not being right for everyone. So that's the purpose of, I can definitely appreciate the price point doesn't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. Then that last point, I'm curious, what would you need to see included to make the price point seem reasonable? Yes. Yes. You know what I love about that part? It invites mm -hmm. people to step off the complaining pedestal mm -hmm. and step onto the problem solving pedestal. Um, I have long been the type of person, even when I was managing humans, which I do not suggest if you're out there listening, <laughs> one star do not recommend. Um, nope. But when I was managing other humans and they would rush into my office with problems, they would always regurgitate something that they heard me say, which was, Ren, I know this is an issue and I know you don't like me coming in with an issue if I haven't already thought about a solution, mm -hmm. but I have thought about a solution. So here, here's what I'm suggesting. I am just the type of human that does not want to hear people complain incessantly about things with the, like, give me one sentence about the situation and give me five paragraphs about how we're going to fix it. That makes so much more sense for the way that my brain works. So when you ask that person, you know, I'm curious, number one, curiosity is always better than judgment, right? But I'm curious, what would make it worth it for you? Now, that, now you've disarmed them to the extent that they've got to step off the complaint pedestal and get on the problem solving pedestal. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, they've never even really considered the answer. They're just going through life objecting, but they never actually thought about what they would agree to. And it's such a, yep. it's such a great, it's such a great piece of um, unexpected coaching from the coach that they're talking to for someone to say, I'm curious, what might solve this for you? Um, that's just it. Like, again, the whole first part of this answer is so Jedi level. Um, oh. Shout out to Jeff uh, and Catalina, by the way. Uh, our favorite yes. Jedi ex mayor. Our Jedi. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, awesome. but, but, um, but I love that so much. And again, I apologize for interrupting. I'm going to sip some tea right. now. Well, it's my dad's kind of like this. Like, his instinct is to say no to everything. Right. That's just kind of <laughs> autopilot for someone and they just need to go through the thought process. And right. so that's why a sales call is a coaching call at the end of right. the day. Um, but what's really interesting is that when you are showing curiosity and you get them to dig deeper is what they actually bring up mm -hmm. is so often something that you offer and you may have even said it, 
but they didn't understand, or you said it in a right. way that was very feature driven instead of benefits driven. Yeah. Right. Or maybe you didn't mention it at all because you were saying all of the things that you do and it got lost in the shuffle or, you know, right. what have you. But I find that that solves it the vast majority of the time is by asking this question. And it's usually something that you do offer and they just missed because mm -hmm. it's hard to be present. You know, they're probably walking around doing chores while they're on a call with you or, you know, yeah. some people just can't sit, can't sit still right for very yeah. long. Um, and it's hard to, to really focus and pay attention. So by asking that it's making them do the work of figuring out, okay, what would it be worth? And then sometimes it's something dumb that you could totally add that you're like, well, yeah, if you say yes, I'll do that. Absolutely. Um, I, so I it's, love that there's, phrase hmm. when, when you, when you, when something, when something happens, uh, and, and, uh, and like a potential client suggests that there's something that's missing that you could easily mm -hmm. add than just the phrase of, okay, I, I understand. So what you're saying is X, Y, Z, and they'll say yep. yes. And then I'll say, so basically if X, Y, Z is available, we'd be moving forward at this point. Is that what you're saying? Right? Because having that information is so crucial to connecting it and then offering that, oh, if that was in place, what you're saying is we be moving forward today. You get that agreement. And like you said, you're now you're right back in the enrollment process. Like it's, it's like the, the, it's like the objection never happened at that point. So I, I love curiosity so much. This is, you know, I'm over dissecting the first line of this thing, but it's so good. I remember, and now I remember the reading the post. So I'm excited about my ability to recall it. Um, at this age, <laughs> it doesn't works. take a lot to get me excited. Uh, but, uh, but, but yes, yeah, it's, it's so good. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to sip more tea and be quiet again. Nope. You are totally fine. Uh, I mean the worst case scenario, right. Is they still say no. So, but you don't lose anything by trying and you right. may learn something that is preventing other people from saying yes. So again, it's not beneficial just for that call, but for future calls as well. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the framework so there's there's not mm -hmm. much beyond that to discuss but i thought what would also be helpful is kind of two things is getting ahead of the objection of you're too expensive um so i think we could we could dive into that a little bit absolutely and then also discussing the difference between you're too expensive and i can't afford it because those are two very different mm. things mm. Um, absolutely but they're right. all tied in to this so the the what we just talked about tells you how to handle it, but mm -hmm. let's dive in a little bit to how to actually get ahead of it. So it's less likely to happen in the first place. Yes. Yes. I, I, I'll, I'll default to whatever you want to go over, but I, I definitely have some, some things that I use in the enrollment process and, and things that I share with our, our coaching students to help them sort of, like you said, sort of head off the objection at the past before you ever get there. Um, because a lot of times, we have a fear of objections and rebuttals mm -hmm. and it's um, it's unfounded because it's really just someone who wants more information, right? If they're, if they're objecting, there's interest there. Uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. when you don't get any feedback from the potential client that you're, you've probably stepped in a big pile of shit. Um, yes. Shout out to Jane. Um, so <laughs> you really, really want to consider um, you know, where did I go wrong? Um, so, so, you know, I'll play devil's advocate here. W what are your thoughts about sort of, um, preventing or handling or addressing the, this type of potential objection? Like what, what's your thought in, in, in terms of that? So in my mind, talking to students, the biggest issue is that they're selling instead of coaching. Right. And right. so coaching means that we listen mm -hmm. far more mm -hmm. than we talk. Yes. And that's one yeah. of the biggest problems is that they go into like podium mode. Okay. I have the floor. Right. Let me shout out my, my entire pitch that hasn't been customized to you whatsoever. And then please buy from me. You're right. And like, that's right. often what happens. So that's probably the number one issue that I see, but I'd love for you to go over kind of your process and what you're telling the students to do to help yeah. head off 
the you're too expensive objection. Yeah. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head here, Amber. Like really have I listened enough to understand, have I listened enough to understand what the correct buttons to push are? Right. And, and that all happens sort of in that discovery part. And like you said, this is the part of an enrollment process, however you do it via Zoom or via phone call or via, um, you know, and a link for a survey. Initially, at least this is the part of the, the, the call that I think we're most likely to rush through because we just want to get to the presentation. Like right? we're, mm -hmm. we're nervous about the presentation and what's coming later is distracting us from what's happening now with the call. So a few things that I like to do during the discovery portion that help me with value, which is really what your too expensive is, it's a value mm -hmm. issue, um, is listening for the things that they say in terms of what they're capable of doing, what they feel like they're not capable of doing, and what they want to have happen. So oftentimes, there, there's really two key questions that I like to ask in the beginning of the discovery and really dig deep and understand them. One is um, sort of why now, right? Mm -hmm. So, Amber, you know, why now? Why, why is this important to you now in a way that you're willing to have a conversation with somebody like me? Um, because I want to understand what the, what the driver is. Right. And sometimes they give me a shallow answer and I'll say, well, I guess that sort of makes sense. But really, why now? And typically after that, they'll give me a deeper answer. And when they give me their reason why it's important now, I'll usually follow that up by saying, so if I'm understanding correctly, you're 100 percent sure that now is exactly the right time to do this. Mm, love that. I want them to commit to that. I want them to say, yes, now is 100. I'm using that language. Now is 100% exactly the right time to do this. But the second question well, it's not the second, but another question that I found is really important here is why do you think it's not working what you've tried up to this point, mm. right? Because there's no value in thinking I can do it myself, right? right. And, I, and I really want them to express the urgency and I want them to express their own inability to solve this because that drives up the value of what I'm going to suggest, right? So those two things have been really important for me in enrollment processes so that we see the value of it generally and the value of addressing it immediately. Um, and from there, I'm just listening to the things that they're saying it's especially when they're telling me why they think it's not working, right? Because I've had people tell me, well, I think it's not working because I really don't do well in processes where I'm isolated um, and sort of have to figure things out in between the time of interacting with a coach. So now when I go back to do my pitch, I've got a feather in my cap. I can talk about how my program will not isolate you. And I'll say, you know, I look at three steps that you may be away from your goal when I'm talking to potential clients. For you, step one, I think is community. Uh, so I have a free Facebook group for clients only because I know how problematic it is for you when you feel isolated, like you're out on Internet Island and you don't have great contact between contact points where you're talking to your coach. So I have six contact points each week that you can utilize, but you don't have to. So, so the fact that I listened to that specific thing that they said, made a little note of it, went back and explained how this program gets you around that thing, it's often a missed opportunity yep. because we get so anxious about the sale part. Yes. And we kind of don't pay attention to the things that they tell us that are going to help us to coach them into enrollment. Um, so, so that's, that's one of the things for me. And then just tying down on the value when I get there um, by asking, you know, based on what I've told you so far, scale of one to 10, 
One being, I hate your face, Ren, and your hat looks stupid. <laughs> you know, how many times being, have people said that? <laughs> uh, not ever, but I give them the opportunity to if they want to. All right, all right, all right. To to ten, ten being, this is exactly what I didn't know I needed to solve this problem. Finally, mm-hmm. where do you sit? And a lot of times we'll ask for money without gauging the certainty yes. with that type of question. And all of a sudden I can't afford it or it's too expensive because yep. certainty is not going to increase after you say a price, right? Yeah. Where, wherever it is, it's a bungee cord. It's falling off from there. <laughs> um, they'll bounce back up, but they'll never bounce as high as where they started. Um, so uh, such a good, good visual. Yeah. So, so some of the things, some of those things help prevent me having that value issue. Um, I, I hope that makes sense the way I explained it. Yeah, it does. Well, and what I love especially is how you talked about the feature, right? You could have just said, well, you know, you'll never be alone because I have a community Right. You know, that you can post in any time. Like, no, like that doesn't connect. So you right. bring it back, like, look, I have six touch points that you have the option to use. So that way you never feel alone. Right. And that's the thing that sells. It's not the the Facebook community group. It's not the calls. It's you will not feel alone in this process. Right. Right. And right. that's the key. And it's so and I, I get that. it. It's so hard. It's so hard not to be focused on your pitch, right? Mm-hmm. But but for our students out there, I promise you, even if you forgot what you were going to say in terms of how you're going to present your, your coaching, even if you forgot all that, if you only just put a lot of effort into the listening part of it, it'll, it'll really solve the back half of your, your enrollment uh, calls, videos, however you do it. Um, Mm -hmm. Because when you're over, when you're overly anxious about what you're going to say, it's just impossible to listen. Like it it just, it can't be done. You're going to miss, people are going to hand you the keys to the car and you're not paying attention because you never drove stick shift. Um, and you're not going to remember which key goes to their car. Like that's, that's, what's going to happen. And and then, you know, you, everything's jacked up from that point. Um, but, but I, when you I, don't know what to say, I, I love yet. it. Like that's the right. problem. You don't know what right. to say. If there is no script. There's a framework, you know, to, or a checklist of some sort, but you actually don't know what to say until you talk to the person. So going that's in with a predetermined so script is, is. I know that it feels so like the right brilliant. thing, but it's it's counterproductive. That's the like just like the smartest thing I've ever heard anybody say in regards <laughs> to sales. Like just go in with the understanding that you don't know what to say. Don't try to remember what to say. It's a discovery call for you just as much as it is for them. Right. Man, wow. that's such good advice. Just go in with the understanding that hey, I don't even know what's the right thing to say is. And if I don't pay attention to this early part, I'm going to find myself in a situation where somebody doesn't see the value and they're going to say it's too expensive or they don't understand it and they're going to say I can't afford it, which may be an actual real logistical thing. Yeah, we'll talk but, about but that. But either yeah. way, yeah, but either way, if I don't, if I don't listen up front, if I don't put my, all my energy there, nothing after that really matters. After you haven't listened, nothing really matters. That's so good. I'm going to take another sip of tea. Yeah. The the oh. other thing that I would, like another phrase that I, I love is tell me more about that. Because yes. like you mentioned earlier is people give such surface level answers or they're uncomfortable or they're afraid of oversharing. Like that's always a, a thought in my mind is I overshare everything. And so I'm trying to be careful <laughs> and not overshare. And so you have people like me that are trying to be careful. And so by asking them to give more, it, it yes. helps you get into the real issue. Because if someone says like, well, um, you know, it's, it just, it feels like a lot of work and I don't know how to get my, my family on board. Right. 
Cool. That's interesting. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yes. Because that's such a vague, not not excuse, but reason, right? Yes. What about that family dynamic makes it difficult, right? Is it because the husband's not supportive? Is it because everybody's really picky eaters? Like dig way down deep into yes. what that literally means for them. Oh my God. And that's, that's another so reason why people fail at a sales call is because they don't get to the actual answer of what's happening. Yes. It's, it's really the questions, isn't it? It's, it's always going to be the questions that we ask. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've found myself, so over the last three months, I've gone uh, 15 out of 17 on enrollment calls from, mm. from October, November, December, right? Which is awesome. That's, that's a good thing. It's fantastic. Um, that's huge. And, and the, uh, the folks over in OTM will probably tell me it's time to raise your prices, Rand. You should never go. Yes on a streak like that at your original price conversation for another 50%. time. Yes. I've, <laughs> I've exposed myself uh, to doing it wrong. Uh, thank yep. you. But we all do. Yep. But, um, but one of the ways that I've been able to do that is using the question that Amber just so eloquently put out there. Just tell me more about that because what I found is, and this also led me to the, I can't afford it and it's too expensive mm -hmm. objection. What I found is in a sales enroll in an enrollment call, you're very likely to panic and, and try to solve a surface level problem that you don't yet understand. Um, for instance, I'll get to my final price and someone will say um, previously, I get to the final price and I'll say, let's say it's a thousand dollars say, okay, so um, for everything we talked about, et cetera, et cetera, thousand um, dollars. And someone will say, do you, do I have to pay it all at once? And then I'll default to, well, you could do this or you could do that, or you could pay it this way, or you could pay it mm -hmm. with form. Like I'm trying to solve just that initial service level question of, do I have to pay it all at once? Instead of what I do now, which is just ask a question. Um, that's what most clients do. I'm curious, what made you ask? Right. Mm -hmm. That is such a Jedi level Brilliant. response. I'm curious, what made you ask that? And I've had people tell me things that I would have absolutely botched. People say things like, oh, well, I've got more in my this account than I have in that account. I just want to know which account to use. But here I would have gone <laughs> with, you know, oh, you can do this and you can do that. And what, but I'll do this. You need me to discount it. Like I would have gone off the deep end yeah. solving that put problem the burden on where them. just saying, put the burden on them. I'm curious, what made you ask that? Oh, I just want to know which account to use. And the problem solved and the sale goes through and it's easy peasy. So a lot of the times when you have a desire to panic and go into solution mode, keeping those questions in your back pocket, oh, tell me more about that. And uh, I'm curious what made you ask. Keeping those two questions in your back pocket solve so many things and bring so much clarity to the exchange that you're having with this human because I'm probably speaking for Amber here as well, but because of my personality type, I'm sort of assuming a greater challenge than what life is usually presenting to me. Um, mm -hmm. And we my... ourselves. Right. And my instinct <laughs> is to panic and fix it. Oh yes. shit, I need to panic and fix it. I need to freak out and fix it. Oh my God, how am I going to handle this? Like, that's my first instinct. Yep. My second instinct is to casually say, Hey, I'm curious, tell me more about that. Right. And I don't know about you, Amber, but I'm calming a thousand raging voices oh, in my yeah. head as I pretend to be in control and softly, gently say, Can't tell me more about that. Like, my brain is raging uh, with doom at that point. So that, that's such, that's such a good point about asking those questions because it really does allow you to understand better what level at any given time that potential client is holding value for what they've gotten from you so far and the, and the propensity for you to hear the phrase, I think it costs too much, right? Yeah. Until you ask those questions, 
you'd be unfairly judging the potential client uh, thinking that they're cheap or they're combative or whatever, uh, when in actuality, you guys just don't understand each other yet. But fundamentally, that's what's happening. Um, I'm going to well, sit Part of our job too. is to filter, uh, so that, I nailed right? That so like, that's part of the reason mm-hmm. why we have to ask so many questions is yes. otherwise, and this is what most yes. coaches do is they tell everything. You're asking questions yes. to help yourself filter the information that they need because there's a 90% of it they don't care about. There's probably one thing that they are really looking for that they may not even know themselves. Yes. And so your job yes. is to filter. So even the question about like t- about payment, like I'm curious, you know, what made you ask is taking the burden off of them of having to figure out a solution. You were doing right. the work so you can present the right thing so they don't have to think about it because the more they have to think about about it, they're going to give you the, the objection of, I need to think about it. Yeah, So 100%. asking questions eliminates all of that stuff. Uh, so that way you can get down to the, to the true value driver for them. I, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on something because hmm. this is something that I, I feel like I've come to realize it actually pretty early on in my career. Um, but when I was doing insurance sales, it was for life insurance. And we were, you know, I don't want to get all patriarchal here, but we were primarily trying to ensure the father, dad, husband uh, in the family, usually, because I was working with a, a union company. And uh, most of the time, the union worker was this, the, the father, the, the dad. Sure. Um, but I used to tell my, my agent something. I used to tell him, like, um, your ability to make this enrollment for insurance happen is dependent on the amount of love in the house. If there's no love in the house, you don't have a shot, right? Like yep. I, I've sat and, and presented and had husbands literally say with their wives and children at the dinner table, well, I kind of don't care what happens to them after I die. That's another man's problem. I literally say that, which, oh my God, it, which is batshit crazy. <laughs> But I've had it happen yeah. many, many times, right? Um, sadly, but and, yep. and I get my briefcase and I get up. And if I was coaching another agent, <coughs> excuse me, the agent would say, why didn't you give any rebuttals to that objection? I was like, because there's nothing to do here, kid. Like, there's no love in the house. I can't put it there. In terms of what we do, I've often said that the potential client needs a certain amount of a certain amount of self-belief also. And if they don't believe in their ability to change, any price is too much. There's no way to get value out of it if they already feel like, number one, they know they're not going to do any of the things that are required in the program. Um, And number two, they just, they have a deep-rooted belief in their own inability to change, right? Yeah. what I, I'm, we've never, this is slightly off topic, but I'm curious, what, okay. what are your thoughts about that? Like, does that, does that make sense? Oh yeah. And, and I, I think that's brilliant. And, and do our, do our coaches self criticize in situations where probably nobody <laughs> could help that person because they don't believe they can be helped. You know what I mean? Like, I've always felt like that's something that coaches need to be aware of as they do enrollment calls and try to coach three people through enrollment, et cetera. Yeah. It kind of makes me think of, uh, sorry for the dogs, the, um, sorry. kind of the gold, the golden question. So like every business has a golden question that helps them identify their person, their, mm. their ideal customer. And so this is kind of like that. So is there love in the house? Right. And Mm -hmm. if, if there isn't, then that's not the right customer and you're probably not going to win them over. Um, I, every coach may have a different question that they have to find that helps them answer that. Um, I remember, um, a company as a pet company and their golden question was, do you buy your pets Christmas gifts? Mm. Right. And if they say yes, that's their, that's the type of client, you know, that, that would buy from them. Damn, that's awesome. So, right. And so 
finding that question, right? And so that's the, what's the foundation here to help establish whether something would feel too expensive because obviously that's super subjective. Right. And having that question, like, is there a love in the house or do they have some, de some degree of self-belief in their ability right. to change? And you may have to find your own question yeah. to, to answer depending on who your client is. But yes, a hundred percent. I agree with you. I think that's super smart. That's a, that's a great, I'm, I'm thinking now like another scale of one to 10 is scale of one to 10. Um, you know, uh, what, you, what, what do you believe your ability to change is one being, you know, you're made of stone, uh, you know, 10 being you're a shapeshifter. Like what, do, mm -hmm. what do you believe your own ability to change the course of your life is? Because that really does get to the root of some things. Um, and I've run into people who just don't believe that they've got a fixed mindset. They don't have a growth mindset. Yep. They just don't believe that in their ability to change. And I can see how that could take a toll, particularly on a new coach yes. running into that personality type and feeling sort of like the onus is on them. Again, it's, yeah, it's they get back to the for original. Everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's back to the original conversation of, you know, you're too expensive. Um, mm -hmm. again, which is just so, so crushing to hear early in your career. Like at this point in my career, if somebody said that to me, I'd say, Hey, I totally get it. Not for everybody. Right. And, yep. you know, and probably go through your protocol, you know, July of 2014, <laughs> I don't know if I'm still in the online training business, particularly in the absence of having an OTA structure because it, it wasn't around then. Um, I don't know if I make it through that. I may still be in person only if someone had told me that. Um, I definitely would have never raised my prices in the course of that first year had somebody told me that. Um, I, I guess the I guess the overall message here is people are going to say stuff, right? And it's not necessarily a reflection on who you are as a coach or the quality of service you provide. But it's also not necessarily a reason to become overly combative with the person that said it, right? Yep. Instead of taking it to heart or being disappointed, get curious, you know, be more curious about what they said um, and, and thank them for giving you some data. Hey, thanks so much for giving me that information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely not right for everyone. That's, that's for sure. I'm curious, you know, what? What moves the needle for you here? What would you love to see in a program that would that would bring it up to the level of the investment that I just mentioned, um, yep. and and putting that onus on the, on the client? Because I think now you're in a more collaborative conversation than combative, yes. man. And that's always mm -hmm. anytime you get it, whether you're whether you're debating football teams or politics. Like once the conversation starts to get collaborative, that's where things start to get solved in the context of the conversation. Um, again, I just, I love the phrasing of everything that you said so much. And thank you for that nugget about the golden question. Cause I'm going to be thinking a lot about that. I'm, I'm wondering now what my golden question is, um, you know, and I, and I'm thinking back even, um, because you sparked this thought process. I'm thinking back even to back then when I was doing insurance and maybe asking something like, I'm curious, how did you guys meet? Um, mm -hmm. uh, because you could probably infer a lot about the um, level of love in the house when you're hearing a, a married, an experienced married couple recall how they got together. I bet that tells a lot about the amount of love that's in the house. Um, yeah. You know, if he gets up and walks out and says, let her tell it, uh, then it's probably past yeah. a bit past the honeymoon phase. Uh, or do they gush? We're like, oh, well, we were yeah. in high school sweethearts and we've been yeah. together for 27 years. Like, okay, we're on. <laughs> we're on. Like, that's it. We're so on. The yep. questions <laughs> are so important. Uh, yeah. And I think and the deeper you get into sales, the more you realize that. Yeah. And what's really, I think, difficult for people to keep in mind is that language is very nuanced. Right. And so how you interpret a comment is different yes. often than how they meant it. And so 
that's why one of the things I wanted us to cover too, is the difference between you're too expensive and I can't afford it. And then how to yes. figure out the difference. Yes. Because for a lot of people, when they say you're too expensive, what they actually mean is you're too expensive for me because I can't afford it or right. there's a value issue, right? And so it's usually yes. one of those two things and you have to figure out the difference. Is there anything that you do to help separate those things? What, one of first having that tie down about like the scale of one to 10, how, um, you know, do, do you feel like this is the thing that you, you always needed that's going to get you to your scale of one to 10, one being, you know, I hate your face, friend, your hats are stupid. 10 being, <laughs> this is exactly what I need to get exactly where I want to go. Like if I can get them to commit to a nine or a 10, I know I've probably got great value there. Like they get it, they understand it. So for me, if I get a money objection after that, I can pretty much be sure that it's an actual money objection, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what I follow up with is if they say, I, I just, I can't find the, the money to do that, right? I'll say, hey, I completely understand. And I'll isolate the money objection and put it to the side. So I'll say, hey, I completely get it, right? I understand. Um, maybe a little bit more than you were considering. Let's set that aside. Let's say the money's there. Regardless, that you've you've already got the you trip over a thousand dollar bill, uh, you know, walking into the kitchen as we're talking on the phone, um, and the other side says free gift from God or some whatever, right? <laughs> Let's just isolate that. Um, if yep. that happened, are we probably getting started today? And yep. they give me a yes. I'll say so. It's your intention to do this. It's more of a how thing than it is a should I thing, right? Yeah. Now I'm isolating it, right? I'm getting them to, oh, yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a should I thing. I know I should. I just can't put the money yet. Now I've got a money objection, right? Now I've got an affordability objection. And I can go into um, getting them to sort of open up their wallet, which feels super awkward for me. But it's it what I do. Everybody. I'll say, yeah, I'll say, hey, you know, so since it's your intention to do this and you're ready to do this. And since you realize what a great change it's going to make in your life, is it with your permission? Okay. To have an open, an open and honest conversation about the investment involved, a money conversation. If they say, yeah, I'll go into again, what's super awkward for me. And I'll say, so let's talk about your cash on hand. And what I mean by that is differentiation between you know, what you have in checking, uh, et cetera. Um, and I'll say, so what, you know, what do you have available in checking at the moment? And again, this feels super intrusive. I know there are people listening right now, freaking out. I'm freaking out as I say it. And I freak out every time I say it, but if I'm going to coach this person, I've got to deal with the awkward nature of the facts in the situation. Exactly. Um, it's like shooting that first picture for clients that want to take an initial picture it's not going to be a bed of roses, mm -hmm. but I need to help them find awareness of what's actually happening. If that's the type of coaching that I'm doing with that human. Um, yep. So, so then I know I've got a true money objection, but uh, if I ask that question, so um, money aside, you found the money. Let's take that out. Um, if that's no longer a part of the issue, Will we probably be getting started today? And they say, no, I don't know. I don't, I mean, mm -hmm. okay, now I've got a value thing, right? Yes. I, I didn't exactly. get good certainty up front and it's too expensive. Isn't, I can't afford it. It's mm -hmm. a, I don't see the value in it yet. Um, and, and I will go back and retrace it and I'll say, you know, what takes you there? You know, what, what again, the back half of your statement, Amber, I completely understand it. You know, I, I get that. You know, our prices aren't for everybody. You know, I'm curious what would have to change in the program that would that will that would equate with the investment involved for you. Right. I'm just I'm getting curious again. So that's that's sort of how I go about it. Well, what, what are your thoughts are uh, about the sort of the differentiation between 
the affordability and the value? It's the same thing. It's it's peeling the onion, right? And it's mm-hmm. it, it can take a few layers before you get there. And you don't have to answer yep. every objection, right? So like if you if you say, you know, if you mention the money and they're like and it's time if you're ready to go, right? If if money wasn't an issue, would you be ready to go today? And they hem and haw and they tell right. you something else. It still may not be that thing. Keep playing right. the game. Okay, if we sorted that out, would you be ready? If we sorted mm-hmm. that out, would you be ready? Once you get a yes, that's the objection you actually have to tackle. You don't have to right. go back and tackle everything else. Mm-hmm. Tackle that right. objection and then move forward with the sale because that was actually the issue. So, but otherwise, so it's the hard exact to feel same that thing. Angle. It is. It's, well, it's uncomfortable. It's so- we feel like we're being pushy. Absolutely. And, and it's, Absolutely. it's not your coaching. I mean, if you're saying, well, you know, sell your car, you know, that's pushing. Right. But if you're right. asking questions to help them process, because again, just like, just like we're kind of panicking on the inside, they are too, right? They're yes. having this awkward conversation with someone that they may not know very well. And they have right. all of these internal thoughts and they're probably trying to listen really hard and still not retaining a whole lot of stuff. And so they have their old internal dialogue that they're dealing with yes. your job is to help them through that something that i do i don't know if you do this or not but one of my favorite things is to be super transparent at the beginning like look yes i'm gonna ask some tough questions you know are you okay with that yes and just letting them know up front that i am gonna ask some tough questions because then that makes it feel like for me that eases my own anxiety of right. asking something that i feel is awkward and so right. naming it up front or even joking about it, I'm like, all right, I got a tough question for you. Are you ready? Right? Like yeah. just getting that that bridge makes it so much easier for me. Yes. And and I think I think people, I really believe that people realize that it's coming from a place of professionalism, number one. Mm-hmm. Um, probably not two, but maybe one A, actual compassion for yes. Helping them course correct this one freaking existence that they get. Like they don't get another shot at living. Um, and and this is where all the, the whole imposter syndrome and belief stuff gets wrapped up in it. Because you really have to go into it believing that you are one of the humans on the planet that can help them course correct their life. And when when you actually believe that it makes it a lot easier to ask tougher questions because you really genuinely want to help. If we let these, these people have been letting themselves off the proverbial hook for decades and all it's done is made their life less enjoyable. You hear it in their stories, you hear it in the discovery call, you hear them talk about, you know, for instance, not taking all their clothes off when they're with their significant other. Mm-hmm. Like, man, that's no freaking way to, to live. live. That way. Right? That's no nope. way to live. And and if 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 you don't if you're unwilling to share those awkward questions and those awkward moments as the professional, hey look, I'm nearly a 50 year old man. Next time I go to the doctor, there's a likelihood that the doctor's gonna put his <laughs> finger up my butt. <laughs> yep. It is what it is. I mean, <laughs> but as a professional, that's his job. It's his mm-hmm. job to help me endure that slightly awkward moment that has such a tremendous upside for what his position is in other humans' lives, right? He's just, he's got a glove up and hopefully yeah. get some type of lubricant um, hopefully. and then go about the business. <laughs> Um, and maybe a little well, dinner after, value. I don't know, but yeah, but that's the value. Um, right. is, and, is and the value we've got to be the adding. same way as professionals. Mm-hmm. Yes. No. We've got to be the that same way as is helping them through that, through that conversation yes. because Absolutely. other, other people aren't right. If you can't mm. have those difficult conversations, right. You're missing out on delivering value mm-hmm. because any change that they need to make isn't going to be comfortable. So if you can't talk them through this uncomfortable moment, you're not going to be able to help them change after because you have to have these awkward, uncomfortable conversations. 
And so this is your first opportunity to see how you can do it and if they can handle it. Because if they can't handle an uncomfortable conversation, they may be an extraordinarily difficult client to work with. Yes. Yes. The, the, the more difficult that you have through the enrollment process, probably the less difficulty you're going to have during the coaching process, even though enrollment's Mm -hmm. an extension of coaching. If that enrollment comes off too easy and then you arrive at some difficulty during the process, you don't know if you're capable of getting them through awkward, difficult spots, which is most of what they're going to need from a professional. It's someone who Mm -hmm. can sit down and have the awkward, uncomfortable, sometimes perceptibly invasive conversation that breaks them through to the next, the next satisfact, the next activation as and you use the term that John would use. Um, man, that's just, that's a really keen observation. Um, you've got to coach them eventually. So why not start doing the enrollment with st- locking step and holding hands through those awkward moments of that conversation. It's it's necessary. They're they're not going to change by themselves. That's for sure. That's, that's why you're talking. Yep, exactly. So I think that's probably a good spot for us to wrap up, but hopefully this helps the whole, you're too expensive conversation is, is way more nuanced than people Mm -hmm. approach it with. So approaching it with empathy, understanding, curiosity is going to serve you far better than some kind of um, reactionary, defensive kind of reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, You'll often find that people who say that they can't, or that something is too expensive, that they can be won over Mm -hmm. if you approach it right. Absolutely. Um, That's also what she said. Who's the third person that's usually here? I forgot what is what his name is. I know, is. I know. Well, I, I guess know. I should save the the jingle yeah. for him. Maybe when so. He gets back. All right. Uh, Maybe. I'll listen to some old episodes so I can remember who the other person is that's usually here. Oh. I slipped my mind at the moment. Um, some Let Jim, me pull up James an episode. Or James. Uh, <laughs> Jerry. I'll, I just know he has a kid who poops on carpet. That's all I know about him. Uh, <laughs> I can remember that. Yes. That's vivid for me. All right, so we'll recommend episode 98, uh, Attracting the Wrong Clients. So this is a hot seat episode that is from the online trainer mentorship that John does. And and Ren is a part of, not as a a coach, but as a participant. Yeah, John, Um, that's his name. Yeah, John. Jonathan, John, John. That slipped my mind. Uh, But the the idea is, is, you know, are we accidentally attracting the wrong clients. A lot of times mm-hmm. we have the intention mm-hmm. of, of trying to attract a certain type and the way that we talk or the way what we share attracts the wrong people. And so in this hot seat, we're trying to figure out how do we course correct if that feels like is a problem for you. Mm. Uh, so again, episode 98, attracting the wrong clients. Awesome. Good, good show. Hi, Ren. Uh, yeah, we, we survived. Yeah, stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs>